In this video, I'll show you how to measure TS parameters, share a few tips, and discuss driver braking as we compare this brand new 1100 series 12 to one that I've been using in my home studio for the past three years. So there's a number of ways and a range of tools available for extracting TS parameters. Today we'll look at arguably the simplest and the least expensive method using the Dayton audio test system. You can pick one of these up for around a hundred bucks from Parts Express, and if you're building your toolkit more or less from scratch, this device may well spare you having to invest in a standalone frequency counter, a tone generator, an oscilloscope and a basic multimeter. Be sure to check out the measurement and accuracy white paper for a more comprehensive look at what to expect in terms of precision. I myself have been using these things in one form or another since the original WT3 which I still keep as backup. Anyhow, the first thing that we'll always want to do before a measurement session is to calibrate the test rig, and here it's a simple two-step process. First, there's the test calibration where the system measures and then accounts for the resistance across its own cables. Then there's the impedance calibration with a known value, in this case a 1000 ohm resistor that comes with the kit. Having done all that, we're ready for the sub, and the first order of business is to cradle it in a way that leaves the pole vent unobstructed. If there isn't one, then obviously don't worry about it. I like to use these foam blocks which help to decouple the sub from the workbench, reducing the amount of vibration transferred between the two. They also cope well under heavy stress. When it comes to a dual voice coil sub, whether you measure it wired in series or in parallel is entirely up to you, and there's an excellent article written about this on the Smith & Larson audio website which I'll link to down below. For this test, the sub will be wired in series, just like the one sitting in the enclosure across the room, and it looks like everything's ready to go, so here is the process. First, we measured the free air parameters, so a moment of silence, and already we have most of the figures complete with the impedance trace. Speaking of which, this is what a clean sample should look like. There should be a smooth rise toward the resonant peak, followed by a second rise as the inductance gradually pushes the impedance toward infinity. In fact, I'll repeat this test on a surface that's a little more prone to resonance. Check it out, see how the trace wavers? It means that something is physically reacting with the driver, in this case it's the shelf. We don't want that, so let's rewind. And now that we're back to a good free air sweep, we can measure the remaining parameters. As you can see, there's actually four different ways to do that. The first method involves you building a test chamber, the second one has you add weight to the cone, the third requires that you know the driver's sensitivity, and the fourth calls for the assembly mass. Personally, I find the added mass method to be the most practical. All you really need is a test weight and something sticky to attach it with. I've gone with brass, which is a non-magnetic alloy, and some of this rubber gasketing compound. The weights are 200 grams a piece, but what we really need to know is how much they weigh with the rubber compound. Just about any digital scale will do for that, and whatever number it gives us is what we enter as our added mass. That's gonna be stuck to the woofer here in a second, but first we also need to measure the effective piston diameter. You don't absolutely need a digital caliper, a simple ruler will do, but this way you get to see exactly where I'm measuring. So, once we have that entered, we can finally test the compliance, and this is where we attach the additional mass. The software then runs a second sweep, compares it to the first one and calculates the actual moving mass and suspension compliance. That's it! That's the entire process. I know I did a lot of talking along the way, but really you just cradle the driver, do a sweep, add some weight, do another sweep, and there's all your electromechanical data. Now let's do the exact same thing with a 12 that's been sitting in an infinite baffle for the past three years, which is about as broken in as I can produce for this kind of a comparison. Once again we seat it, sweep it, weigh it, stick it, Turn it, leave it stop and here's what we get. So if we were to talk about driver break-in, this is the money shot. The parameters for the brand new driver are listed on the left, and on the right we have the ones for its twin brother after three years of... And what we're interested in are the mechanical differences between the two, specifically ones related to the physical stiffness. So that would be the compliance itself, its air equivalent, the mechanical resistance, damping, and the free air resonance. As you can see, the compliance had gone up by nearly 67%, and the air equivalent is right there with it. This makes for a much softer suspension, thus much lower mechanical resistance, 76% lower as it happens. You'll also notice a slightly higher value for the mechanical damping, indicating that there's actually less of it. And don't forget to check out part 1 of my TS Parameters Explained series for a closer look at that. Finally, as I'm sure most of you had anticipated, the free air resonance has shifted down as well. 
And this is where we leave things off. Check out the links down below for the various implements used throughout this presentation. Like if you found it useful, subscribe for more and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!